Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really pleased to be here once more at Rumi Forum. I've been asked to speak about Islamophobia and OIC. Um, Islamophobia is, a, is an old phenomena, or a new name for uh, old phenomena. Um, and today we see different manifestations of this phenomena in different parts of the world, and particularly in the West, with differences between the manifestation of Islamophobia in Europe and in America. <coughs> Islamophobia has taken a new trend here in America after 9-11. But of course, it has its roots before 9-11. In Europe, it has been always there. But after the fall of Berlin War, Islam was reinvented or revisited as the enemy, the potential enemy of Europe and the West, where the mechanisms of defense and the balance of equilibrium should be strike to sustain the vigor and dynamism of the West against a given enemy. And Islam was chosen to be the enemy to substitute communism. It is very strange to see that old feelings, bad feelings, which comes from Middle Ages and which has been reintroduced as new ideas about Islam. And we were astonished to see scholars writing books about these issues and putting old wine in new bottles. I would like to suffice myself by one small quotation from President um, Clinton when he said that the danger of Islamophobia in Europe has reached the level of the danger of anti-Semitism in 1930s. And I think this is the best way to express that. It went to the point that last year, in a European country, which was a former colonial power, people <coughs> desecrated the tombs of Senegalese soldiers who dead for the flag of that country during the First World War in the army of that colonial power, sometimes fighting their fellow <coughs> brethren as Muslims. So when they died and they put in the cemeteries in, in, in that country, now we find people go there, Europeans, and desecrate this, as if, if these people were the conquerors to their land, not the defenders who sacrifice their lives. So the, the phenomena of, 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 of Islamophobia is really rampant. And um, now, nowadays, by the rise of the right wing political parties and the rise of the right wing, the new fascists, the new Nazis, the racist uh, political movements, they all target Islam and the Muslims as, a, as an enemy. Uh, the political movements which appeal to the far right, to the marginal groups, to attract their votes, uh, these political movements are picking up in Europe. Um, this is why I foresee it that the 
Islamophobia will be more of a threat to the Muslims in Europe and in this country. Luckily in this country, President Obama, new discourse has changed the, to a certain extent, these feelings, which were baseless, baseless because as I was alluding to in one of my, uh, in my speech yesterday in the Institute of Peace of the United States, uh, and the attack against the Trade Center in Oklahoma, which was perpetrated by some American citizen, was first attributed to a Muslim, to a Jordanian. And then later on, immediately, people started saying, this is a Muslim or did it. So this prejudice tells, and that was, I think, 1995 or 96. So far, be far be before the 9-11 events. Uh, we in the OIC, of course, the publication of this uh, uncivilized, rude, unpolite Danish caricatures of our prophet, peace be upon him, were the apex of this Islamophobic trends. I must say that the indifference by the Danish government, insensitivity by some European powers to this publication, and just consider it a matter of freedom of expression, not a matter of respect and co consideration for others that this stance has created a lot of anger and reaction in the, world, in, the model, in the Muslim world. Now, let me tell you that in OIC, we were dealing with this issue very closely from day one I came and became Secretary General. And uh, we established an observatory for Islamophobia which started to monitor the different cases and events related to Islamophobia in the West. And then this uh, observatory started to compile a report, an annual report on Islamophobia. And until today, we have published two annual reports a part of 2008 and 2009. And for those who are interested to see these reports, they are available on our website. Plus, there is a window of the observatory in our website which, where you can follow up every day, every week, the activities and the publication of this observatory, which is, I think is very important. And if you are interested in interacting with the, the, the observatory, you're welcome to do that. Now, let me, in the last part of my brief introduction, dwell on what we try to do internationally. We have, uh, we have, uh, tried very hard through the General Assembly of the United Nations and Human Rights Council and Human Rights Council in Geneva to find a joint ground with Europeans to combat this Islamophobia to try invite people to abide with the international rules, with ethics, with the invite them to be responsible in their way of exercising their freedom. We have exhausted all arguments, but unfortunately many European countries 
particularly where the right wing is in power, they are neglecting this, overlooking it, because they made Islamophobia. Even some of these countries, which I will not name, made OIC a domestic issue for political bargaining. And we have seen this in the review of Durban to Durban uh, uh, agreement in, 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 in Geneva last summer. Uh, I have to say that uh, we have noticed since yes last year a positive development in the American position. Um, I had uh, contacts uh, in last year and this year with American high responsibles who are in charge of this file. And we can say that we find better understanding and cooperation with the United States of America vis-a-vis -vis this issue. And we acknowledge that major media in this country were more responsible than their counterpart in some European countries. And that shows the sensibility and the sense of responsibility when, one's, when one exercises his own right of freedom of expression. The, in, the 1965 uh, Convention on Civic and Political Rights which was adopted and ratified by many countries, but almost all countries of the world, stipulates in Article 19 and Article 20 that no freedom could be used to instigate hatred based on religion, gender, race, or whatever. What we are trying to do is to invite people to be responsible and to use their freedom of expression, freedom of thought, not to insult others. This is the basic line which we are really trying to. Uh, with this note, uh, I can say that we have managed to, uh, to a certain extent, to achieve some of respect and I think some countries in the West, in Europe, have learned the lesson where they are themselves are more responsible than it was the case in 2005. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning, Mr. Alaykum Secretary. Um, I'm Jay Saleh Williams. I'm with the Congressional Muslim Staff Association. Um, I want to just thank you first in the OIC and its represent representatives here in the United States and New York, how they've reached out to the Muslim Staff Association in dialogue on how to increase relations between the OIC and our representative government here in the United States. Um, I have a question. In how is in combating uh, Islamophobia globally, but also here particularly in the United States, one way is for leadership, particularly from the President and Congress, to openly engage Muslim, Muslims in America and throughout the world and create constructive, positive relationships, which will counter, I say, the vast majority of Americans who are neither Islamophobic, but not, I'd say, also have a positive disposition. They're just learning. Um, we'll never fully gain the, re you know, the trust of everyone, but that's not the objective. But constructive engagement is always a strong way to convince the masses uh, who are trusting in leadership uh, that the Muslim community domestically and internationally are partners uh, with the United States. And so I wanted to know how is the OIC promoting this type of engagement, particularly seizing the opportunity with President Obama's Ankara speech and the Cairo speech, and how is OIC maybe helping to promote or massage forward uh, some of the initiatives that the President outlined, particularly in the Cairo speech? Well, we, we have been keen to, to do that uh, for the last four years. And we have organized here a major symposium with the Georgetown University. And the proceeding of this meeting uh, has been published uh, in a temporary publication by Al-Walid Center 
and then the book on Islamophobia will be published soon by uh, Oxford University Press. Uh, apart from this, we have been engaged with the Department of State uh, on this issue, as I alluded uh, during the previous administration and now within with the new administration. Uh, the main issue here, I think, what to to deal with Islamophobia, we have to know that the people in this country are different than in other Western countries. This is a society. This is a society of immigrants, and immigrants have this kind of solidarity among themselves, and they welcome newcomers. So we don't feel these bad feelings, some um, bad feelings in different frameworks, social frameworks. Here, a different framework and different psychology, mentality. The old settlers welcome the newcomers. Uh, this is why Islamophobia has no root in this country. So I think it could be dealt more easily. It needs, as you refer to, working on the grassroots. And working with the grassroots needs societies, NGOs, pioneering personalities, and of course, political parties. We have, we then the Muslims in this country need to engage with all this. And they, they need to engage with legislators. Uh, we all understand that President Obama's Cairo speech, Ankara speech, his speeches before that, Inauguration Day speech, all these speeches has created a new environment, a new, a positive, uh, a new psychology. Uh, and we have to make use of that. We don't know how far that will go, but we have to seize the opportunity and I think institutions like Rumi, like CARE, like others, ISNA, and many others, you're aware, more, more aware about them than me, they can do a lot. I just want one small, uh, short follow-up. Um, President, former President Bush made an appointment to Mr. Chumber to be the OIC Special Envoy at the very end of his uh, tenure, his term. Uh, Ms. Farah Punneth was recently appointed Special Representative for State Department to Muslim Global Communities, but she's been very clear that her mandate is not to be a proxy for the OIC Special Envoy. With the OIC, have they made any statement to the State Department that they would like to see a Special Envoy again appointed? Um, any that be constructive? Thank you. Well, I think uh, President Bush's uh, decision to, to appoint a Special Envoy was a very wise and timely decision. Uh, administration has been, and, and Dr. Rice has been in touch with me in those days, and that consultations uh, resulted with the appointment of uh, Ambassador Sadakamba. Uh, though he has stayed in his office a very short period, but he started with a very energetic uh, way, and he in a short period make a positive contribution. Uh, now with the new administration, of course, uh, he resigned because he, it was a political uh, appointment. Uh, and uh, according to the rule, he had to resi resi resign. Uh, we are aware that uh, the, the administration is about choosing a new, per a new name to be a special envoy. Uh, we've been told uh, that uh, Mrs. Farah, or Mrs. Pandit, uh, appointment was not for the position of the special envoy, and that was the official statement as well. And now we, have, we know that the search is about to end for the new name, and we are looking forward to, to that. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Radwan Ziad, a visiting scholar at Harvard University. I have two questions. The first one, uh, um, 
uh, when you elected uh, three or four years ago to the uh, OIC, there is uh, there was a big hope about reform inside the organization. How to see the uh, reform right now, especially uh, you cannot change the name of the organization <laughs> in the last meeting in Jeddah. And the second question was related to the uh, first one. Uh, you mentioned about OIC, it was uh, uh, um, uh, prepared many uh, declarations about the human rights in Islam. And do you see any implements for these declarations inside the Islamic countries? Or if uh, uh, OIC has some uh, policy toward that? Thank you. Thank you uh, for the question. Of course, uh, we start to reform from day one now. We are ending our fifth year and in all these five years the reform campaign went very well. We have changed a lot in the Joint Secretariat structure, uh, new departments, new administrations. Of course the big change in the staff, we have more qualified uh, people who have long uh, diplomatic experiences, academic experiences public service experiences, which we lacked at the very beginning. Now we, and when we are expanding our activities, we have, uh, when I start, we have two offices, one in Geneva and one in, um, in, in New York. Now we're, we opened an office in Baghdad to deal with the situation there. And we're opening an office in Brussels for to be accredited to EU. And we soon will open an office in Somalia to follow up the crisis there. And of course, we have uh, reformed the uh, news agency, INA, the Fiqh Academy. Radically, it was reformed, and many other OIC institutions. But more important than that, that OIC had, in first time in its history, the blueprint, the blueprint for reform and development, not only reforming OIC, but reforming the, or reshaping, reshuffling the concept of OIC, to have a new concept. New concept of OIC can be summarized in two words. Solidarity in action to achieve solidarity among member countries, not by taking resolutions and decisions and um, saying a nice words and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and repeating the old rhetorics about brotherhood and solidarity, not doing that, but doing projects and programs, implementing them to help different Muslim countries in their struggle to progress in a socio-economic way. And you can look to our website and see the 10-year program of action, and you can follow from <coughs> different channels, particularly our website, about our activities, different activities. This is the first point. Second point is the reform of charter. The charter, the old charter was made in early 70s. OIC was about 25, 27 countries. It was a totally different world. And that charter was really a burden for OIC to open its horizons and progress. From day one, I tried to do that. And I'm glad to, that I s to tell you that in a record time, we have changed the charter from A to Z. And that charter was unanimously adopted in Dakar 2008. It took us two years to work out the, the charter. And this has never happened in any other international organization that the charter could have been changed as such short period. Uh, I advise you to read the chat. Again, it is available on the website. You will see that it's speaking a different language. It speaks about human rights, 
speaks about human rights, speaks about democracy, good governance, and many values which our nations aspire to achieve. Uh, so we are working on that. We continue on this. Built in the 10-year program of action and built in the charter establishment of new independent permanent commission for human rights to safeguard and promote human rights within OIC countries. Our next challenge is to do that and we're working on it. I think we're coming to the last question because I have another engagement. Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Edward Allam. I'm a professor of philosophy at a Catholic university uh, near Beirut in Lebanon. Uh, we had a series of conferences on the common word, Christian and Muslim philosophers. I was wondering about uh, that document, just if, first of all, uh, you were a signatory, uh, I understand. Uh, if uh, your signature was in your own name or in the name of the OIC, I was just wondering that. And then at the conference, we had speculated about that, the dynamics that led up to the document. Um, if you could speak just a little bit uh, to that. And then finally, I are there any plans, since a precedent was established for uh, this sort of document, are there any plans for a similar document in the future? Thank you. Well, I don't think we need more documents. We had enough documents. And we have a long experience of interfaith, intercultural dialogue. Maybe uh, one word or came at Musawa, maybe it's the best. But uh, I have my opinion on, on, on these things, which is an opinion out of experience that uh, these exercises are good academic exercises or bad academic exercise. Here, the one you referred to is a very good academic exercise. I don't think we need more academic exercise. What we need is political exercise. Uh, the dialogue for the sake of dialogue has proven to be, in the time of need, is not working. When you have a problem, you face a, a challenge where you need this support for your cause, which is part of the agreed or common ideas. And you tell those who you have been engaged in that, oh, come and help me. They said, well, we are, we are well, inshallah, mashallah. So we have to rethink it. My proposal, my short recipe for that, says that we need to have a well-defined objective, number one. What would be the objective of such exercise or exercises? We should have definition. And this definition of objective should be agreed upon by all parties to the interface, number one. Number two, there should be an agenda agreed by parties. And this again agenda should be progressive agenda. That you start from A, you go to B, to C, to D, and then until you reach the objective. This is number two. Number three, this dialogue should not be only by religious leaders or academicians. It should have political support. And there should be, an, uh, 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 should be political will behind it. If you don't have this political will, all these exercises will end with nice meetings, exchange of good wishes, and then at the best, it will end with a good or bad book. 
And I think I will not waste my time and my energy and my organization time in such ex academic exercise because I spent 25 years of mine doing the first one. So I don't want to spend that. Uh, if I will be a party of that, I will go according to the recipe which I explained to you. And this is what I advise. Thank you. Thank you.